Oh, very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I uh, hope you had a great day today. I know people went out and saw lots of dolphins on the Dow Cruise. Um, we're back on board and we're getting ready to uh, we're sailing, and we've got lots of activities and events placed while we are sailing. And one of them is to have uh, a great lecture on board to give you more information. And it's going to be now an introduction to the ones of Arabia, and I'm going to hand you over to the gentleman who's going to do all, all, everything for you. So please put your together for Ross Arnold. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with all of you all back on the beautiful yacht, Star Pride. Uh, my wife Carolyn and I were on this same itinerary, on this same boat, last year, except in reverse. We started in Athens through to Dubai, and you actually have much the better of it, because um, on that trip, there was an, uh, another speaker. She and I shared the responsibilities, and it was very difficult because we like to do the talks before we arrive at the places that you're going to see these spectacular things. And it's much easier to do it going in this direction because we have an, the majority of sea days before we arrive at Luxor and St. Catherine's Monastery and Petra, etc. So this is going to be easier for us to do. Um, unfortunately, Emily Teeter, who was the Egyptologist um, on the last trip, was not able to make this trip, so I'm your one and only for this. In fact, um, first several people that I met in Dubai, and when they found out I was the lecturer on board, they said, oh, you're the Egyptologist. And I went, no. I'm the other one. So my wife and I thought I should get a t-shirt that said, I am not an Egyptologist, I'm the other one. But I will be doing uh, two lectures specifically about Egypt before we get to um, Egypt and to Luxor. So we'll be talking a lot about those details. But along the way, we're going to be covering an enormous range of details, history, uh, the development of religion, the development of culture, some of the specific sites we're going to be visiting. Um, I'm going to be doing 17 talks in the course of this lecture, so if that makes you feel tired, just imagine how I feel. Um, <laughs> but we're all ready to go with them, so today what I want to do is to give you just a broad overview of where we're going to be stopping in terms of kind of a modern sense of the countries we'll be visiting. And, and we have one more stop in Oman, so we're going to talk about Oman. We've got to, we'll get to Salala in two days, and then we'll talk about Egypt and Jordan and some of the others. As we get into the talks, I will, in each case, break down into a lot more detail. So if you feel today that I'm just sort of skipping over things, well, that's intentional, because this is just an overview to let you know where we're going and what's going to be going on. Um, a little bit about me. My background is um, I started out in philosophy, and then from philosophy went to theology and philosophical theology, then got very interested in world religions and made that sort of a, a minor focus of mine. And when you study world religions, you also have to study the cultures in which they developed and the history around them. And so culture and history, all of that you know, came up. And so Windstar has been very kind for the third time now to invite me to come and talk about those things. So that's why I'm here. I am the director and senior lecturer of a graduate school theological institute called Lakeside Theological Institute in Mexico, where my wife and I live, and I also am the pastor of a Presbyterian church, so there's where that theology part of it comes into. So just so you've got that background for me. Um, let me just jump into it in terms of talking about where we're going to be on this trip. You've seen this map already. I'm sure you saw it. This is part of what convinced you to take the trip. We started out here. I'm going to show you a map. We'll go through the Straits of Hormuz. The Straits of Hormuz is where they always talk about, you know, an American aircraft carrier has been sent to the Straits of Hormuz in the Persian Gulf, all right? We're going right through that area. Around Oman, around this, this area here is the Arabian Peninsula. We'll talk about that. We are going to sail the entire length of the Red Sea uh, to get up to Safaga, which is the port we'll stop at in Egypt to visit Luxor and then other places. We'll, we'll come back to this map again, but I wanted you wanted to remind you of the overall region we're talking about, the area that we know as the Middle East. This has been considered the cradle of civilization, and, and in many ways, um, culture as we understand it, uh, along with Greece sort of refining it for us, this is where civilization began. In fact, this is a very old French map, and you might notice right in the middle of the map, it's not North America, it's not Europe, right in the middle of the map is the Middle East because this has always been understood to be the primary crossroads of human civilization. Uh, if we understand the anthropologists to say that, that humanity as we understand it began in Africa, they very early on crossed the land bridge from Africa into Asia and Europe, and where did they come through to get there? The Middle East. 
And this is the home of many of the most ancient cultures and civilizations that have developed, and we're going to talk about that tomorrow. It's also where many of the, the world's religions developed, including especially the three great monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They all came from this part of the world, and we're going to be talking about all of those. In fact, tomorrow, um, I'll give you a list of all of the talks later on here, but tomorrow the two talks will be Faith and Culture in the Ancient Near East, which is what the Ancient Near East is what we used to call the Middle East, and I'll explain why that changed, and then the Birthplace of Empires, all of the great empires that began in this part of the world, uh, many times one of them taking over from the other, Assyrians, Babylonians, Hittites, Egyptian, on and on and on. We'll talk about some of that tomorrow. But this part of the world is very much seen as where civilization began, quite literally, in the Mesopotamian Valley and in Egypt. All right? So today, you are in Kassab, in the country of Oman. Oman is a fascinating place. In two days, I'm going to do a talk just about Oman, because of all the countries in the Middle East, there are a number of things that, that are quite distinctive about Oman, including the fact that the majority of Omanis are uh, not Shiite, and they're not Sunni Muslims, they are Ibadi, a third flavor. And so we'll talk about that. They also are a sultanate, ruled by a sultan, and um, the UN just uh, a few years ago named Oman the most improved country on the planet, and we'll talk about that. Over the last 45 years, the current sultan, Qaboos, Qaboos al-Sayyid bin Sayyid, has phenomenally changed this country. Those of you who are on the Dow Cruise today heard the, uh, that these people who live in an extraordinarily remote place, I mean, you can't even get to most of these places by road, only by boat, they still have electricity, they're delivered clean water, they have uh, helicopter access to medical care if someone gets sick, they have a boat that picks up their kids to take them to schools. All of those things are a product of the efforts of the Sultan of Oman, who's been in power for 45 years, the longest ruling um, leader in, in the Middle East. A fascinating place. So we're going to talk about that uh, in, in two days time before we get to Salala. When we get to uh, Salala, it is, if you can, uh, can't even see it, down here where most of you can't see, <laughs> down um, southern, the, the southwestern corner, Salala is one of the last major places. That's actually where the Sultan is from. He has uh, a palace there. You'll, if you take the one of the tours, they'll probably drive you by the palace. You'll have a chance to go in the Grand Mosque of the Sultan, uh, which is that what that's what this is. And possibly, I'm not sure. It depends upon where some of the groups go because they change that from time to time. This is the tomb of Job. You know Job from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew Bible. Uh, it's possible that Job is the oldest book in the Hebrew Bible, and the tomb of Job is in the hills above Salala. And this, that's him, apparently, from, from what they tell us, who knows. <laughs> but as you see here, uh, Oman has a population of about 3.8 million. It covers about 309,000 square kilometers. It is a sultan take, which means the sultan has absolute power. But one of the things this sultan has done is he has instituted a parliamentary government, he still has the right to veto whatever he wants, but a parliamentary government in which women have been given the right to vote, women are elected to positions of, in government, they are ministers of government, um, they have pretty much equal rights legally, there's still some traditional um, inequalities that exist, but the Sultan's doing what he can about that. Um, and the gross national product is $163 billion. Now, when he took over 45 years ago, the annual GDP of this country was $100 million. It's now $163 billion. And they are not that rich in oil. In fact, they're 25th in oil production. So he has done much more than just uh, take advantage of the oil. They have some, but he has been a very wise ruler. The fact that he's an absolute dictator, the people still love it because he seems to be very concerned about doing the right things for them. So it's it's very different in many ways than than other Middle Eastern countries, and we'll have one whole talk about that in a couple of days. This is Salala. You can see that one because it's up in the corner. So it's getting close to the border of Yemen, but we promise you no problems. Salala is a very clean. It is a beautiful city. Um, it's very uh, a lot of agriculture. Oman has a strip of green along the coastline, which is where all of their growing before they get into the first hills and then desert land. And so Salala is a, a quite beautiful city, and I'm sure you'll enjoy it when we get there. Again, from, 
from Dubai and Kassab, where we were today, around to Salalah. We then will proceed down through the Gulf of Aden. There's a city right here called Aden. I'm sorry for those of you who can't see where I'm pointing. And then we will go through the Straits, and we will transverse the Red Sea, the whole length of the Red Sea, from the south to the north. And our first stop, and that's when we get a lot of the talks in, because it's going to be five days of uh, sea days. When we get to Egypt, our first stop in Egypt will be, as I mentioned, um, oh, it's not showing up there. It will be um, here, which is Safaga, in order for us to go to Luxor, which is right here. You know, it's a, it's a bus ride, but trust me, this is worth it. The city of, or the, the city of Luxor is the second most visited tourist attraction in Egypt. And it is considered the, it's been called the largest outdoor museum in the world. Because you will see, unless you've been there before, trust me, you do not know what you're gonna, what you're gonna see there. You do not expect this. Um, the Republic of Egypt, it is a republic. It's not a sultanate like Oman. It is a semi-presidential -president, republic. What that means is they have a president and a prime minister. And so the president does not have full authority in the executive branch. They are the most, uh, Egypt is the most populous country in North Africa, it's the most populous country in the Arab, Arab world, and the 15th largest country by population in the whole world. Mm -hmm. It has the largest economy in this part of the world, and interestingly, it has almost 400,000 square kilometers of territory, but, or I'm sorry, miles of territory, but the people, the 86 um, million, 87 almost million people live in just 15,000 square miles because the only place people really live is right along the Nile River. That's the only arable land, the only place you can grow anything. The rest of it is all desert. And so the rest of it is very sparsely populated by Bedouins, etc. But we will talk about the Nile, the importance of the Nile. In fact, Herodotus, the Greek historian, the man who's credited with inventing modern history writing, said that Egypt is the gift of the Nile, which means Egypt would not have existed if it weren't for the Nile River. And it's because of the Nile and the fact that it's surrounded by deserts and the Red Sea on one side that Egypt has the longest contiguous history, human history, of any nation in the world. Over 3,000 years of history that we can track. In fact, historians, if they want to know when something happened in one of the other empires around or one of the other parts of the Middle East, like um, the Egyptian history is all written. And so when the Egyptians say, well, I, Pharaoh, um, Pharaoh Necho, fought a battle with Ashurbanipal of Assyria. That's how they know when Ashurbanipal was, because they know exactly when Necho was there, right? And so that history is very important. One of the fascinating things about it is Egypt has not been without conquerors. It has been at various times conquered by the Greeks, the Persians, the Romans, the uh, Arabs coming in from Saudi Arabia, the Ottoman Empire, and then various Europeans, especially the British. But in almost every case, unlike what usually happens, when these people took over Egypt, they became Egyptians rather than the other way around. Instead of going in and impressing their culture on the people of Egypt, Egypt was so fascinating and mysterious and colorful and beautiful um, that they became Egyptians. Alexander the Great's uh, general, Ptolemy, after Alexander died, took over responsibility. That was the Ptolemaic Empire. And one of the descendants, one of the last descendants of the Ptolemies was Cleopatra who killed herself with the asp, remember? Well, the Ptolemies became e Egyptians. They didn't act like Macedonians or Greeks anymore. They took on the Egyptian culture, and that was, the true, that was true for almost all of the people who came into Egypt, because Egypt was that compelling. We will be going to uh, Safaga from there, visiting Luxor. It is a, a pretty good bus ride, probably about four hours, but um, we will have guides along with us, and so you'll have an opportunity to ask questions, and uh, I'll be along if I can be of any assistance as well. And it is worth the bus ride, trust me on that one. When we get to Luxor, there will be several major things that we will feature, um, and they are first the Karnak Temple. This picture on the bottom here, whoops, wrong button, Picture on the bottom, this is the great hypostyle uh, hall at the, uh, the Karnak Temple. The hypostyle hall has 134 massive pillars, 122 of them are 10 meters tall, 
and 12 of them are 21 meters tall. Now, if you're not used to metric conversion, that's like 70 feet, almost 70 feet tall. This is the second largest ancient religious complex in the world, the Karnak Temple, after uh, Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Angkor Wat is the only religious area larger than this. There are unbelievable uh, hieroglyphics, and we're going to talk about hieroglyphics later on in, in our talks. The, the imagery is extraordinary, and you'll have a chance the evening that we arrive there, they will do a sound and light show at the Karnak Temple. Um, so that alone would be worth going to Luxor. But that's not all, folks. <laughs> we also are going to be visiting the uh, temple of Luxor. The city is named Luxor, but there's a temple of Luxor that's smaller than Karnak, but still extraordinary. It was built by a number of different pharaohs, most especially Ramses II, or Ramses the Great. And you see these spectacular statues of him, that's the guy, uh, in the Luxor temple. When we were there last, my wife and I, we were there in the evening as the full moon rose and you could see it through the pillars. I can't promise you that's going to happen for you. But, well, we can hope. We'll see. We'll check the calendar. Uh, but it is an extraordinary temple. And these two temples, which are a distance apart, were originally, they discovered not very long ago, because all these are still active archaeological sites, they discovered that they were connected by a lane or road that was lined the whole distance by sphinxes, these small ram-headed sphinxes especially, and you'll see some of that because they're just beginning. Once they discovered it, they had to buy up all the property of places that have been built over top of it and then dig it all out, and that's going on right now as they begin to, to take advantage of all of these new findings. Um, the Karnak Temple and the Luxor Temple, especially the Karnak Temple, is unique in the length of time that it was worked on. There were uh, pharaohs from the, the Middle Kingdom all the way through the Ptolemaic time. Uh, more than 30 pharaohs were involved in adding to this huge facility. And again, the guys that we have there are really spectacular. They are, they, again, I'm not an Egyptologist, but they are to the max, and they can give you way more detail than I can, and they really are very good. When we were here a year ago, or not quite a year ago, but last year, um, some of these guides, because of the, the revolution, the Arab Spring, and the effect that it had in Egypt, tourists stopped coming. They're only now, in the last year, starting to go back, and some of these guides said they had not worked in more than two years. And so they're so pleased to have people coming back and so enthusiastic to be able to share this, these extraordinary sites with you that you'll have a great time with the guides. Um, we also will be visiting this, this third image up here. This is the, um, the memorial temple or mortuary temple of uh, Hatshepsut, who was Queen Hatshepsut. You'll learn how to say that. And she was the first of the female pharaohs. And she built this extraordinary memorial temple. Their memorial temples are called the mansions of a million years because they saw this as a way to ensure their immortality. We'll talk about that more as we go along. And then we will visit the Valley of the Kings. You will be able to go into the tomb of Tutankhamun. Now, there's nothing there except poor Tut himself with a blanket over him you know, lying in one corner. And there's a few paintings on the walls. But King Tut was, was a young man, he didn't rule long, he wasn't very significant, and so he was still a pharaoh, so they had to find him a burial place in the Valley of the Kings. And, but they sort of shuffled him into a place that was underneath another tomb, and that's why it, the robbers, almost all of the tombs had been robbed. There are 63 different tombs, and they rank from one room tombs, and two, Tut was only two rooms and a couple of closets, but from one room to um, one of these tombs was 120 different chambers. So some of them are very complex. You'll have a chance, if they follow the same rules that they did when we were here previously, you'll go in King Tutankhamun's tomb, and, and don't be surprised, you'll go in and on the left-hand side as you walk in, there's this glass case, and there's a mummy in there. Like I say, you can see his head, you can see his toes, and there's a blanket over him. They don't even have a note on it that says, this is King Tut, but apparently it is. So you'll have a chance to see King Tut's actual mummy, and then go in three other tombs, and you can pick which three depending upon which ones are open. They don't have them all open at all times because there's always uh, various work going on and, and uh, restorations and things of that sort. But you'll have a chance to visit some of those tombs. We'll get into details about this, but the uh, pyramids of Giza up near Cairo, how many of you all have been to Giza to see the pyramids, okay? Um, that's the most visited. Uh, the Luxor temples and, and King, Valley of the Kings and whatnot are the second most visited tourist sites in Egypt. But 
uh, Giza, these extraordinary pyramids were built in the Old Kingdom. Egypt had three major time periods, Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, and New Kingdom, and I'll give you more detail about those. These pyramids were built in the Old Kingdom. Some of the earliest pharaohs built these tremendous uh, necropolis, these burial places for themselves. The problem was they were so obvious that they very soon learned that those were prime targets for thieves, and people were breaking into them and stealing stuff because they kept gold and all sorts of other things in there. Well, later on, the pharaohs decided being that showy is not a good idea if you want this stuff to stick around. So that's why the Valley of the Kings, and there's a separate location called the Valley of the Queens, where the, the female or the, the, uh, the wives of the pharaohs and other noble women were buried. But in the Valley of the Kings, these literally, these tombs were put underground and mostly unmarked, which is why they're still finding them. The last several that they found were as late as 2008. I don't know that any, they found any since then. And they're still finding them because they were intended to hide where these treasures were and where these, um, you know, the remains of these mummified pharaohs were. Well, it didn't work. Almost all of them have gotten robbed, and that's why Tutankhamun, as small as it was, was such an extraordinary find is because it was so small and it was underneath another tomb that when it was finally found, all of the stuff was still there. It was all sort of crammed in there. It was kind of like an attic. They just all shoved it all in there, but it was, you know, that all the things that a pharaoh would need in the afterlife were present. And so that's why Tutankhamun, even though it was small and he was not significant, was so extraordinary. So you'll have a chance to see that stuff. We then will go on to, still in Egypt, but on the Sinai Peninsula, which is this sort of uh, pizza pie shaped uh, peninsula that sticks down into the Red Sea. On the west side, this is called the Gulf of Suez. It's still part of the Red Sea. And on this side, it's the Gulf of Aqaba. We will be visiting Sharm el Sheikh. And from Sharm el Sheikh, the primary, now there are primary and secondary kinds of uh, trips that you can make from here. I know I spoke to someone today that said he's a diver and Sharm el Sheikh has some of the best diving in the world in the Red Sea and so some people want to do that. That's okay. We forgive you for not wanting to go to St. Catherine's <laughs> Monastery. Okay, I told you I was a minister, right? Anyway, um, so the big tour, I mean the, the sort of featured highlight is to Mount Catherine's which is the, uh, to Mount Sinai, St. Catherine's Monastery, which officially is known as the Sacred Monastery of the God-Trodden Mount Sinai. That's the formal name. Wow. It's called St. Catherine's Monastery. This is the traditional site of Mount Sinai where first Moses saw the burning bush and God told Moses his proper name and told Moses he wanted to go to Egypt and bring his people, the Hebrew people, up out of slavery in Egypt. And then we get the crossing of the Red Sea. And one of my talks is going to be Moses the Israelites and crossing of the Red Sea. And one of the questions is, where did it happen? When did it happen? Did it happen? So we'll talk about that. And the traditional site of the burning bush and of where Moses was given the Ten Commandments was Mount Sinai, which traditionally is right here. It is Mount Cath In fact, uh, Mount Catherine is one mountain, it's right next to uh, Mount Sinai, and the St. Catherine's Monastery is right at the base of it. This is a monastery, it's one of the oldest working monasteries in the world. Um, there were monks here, not in this facility, but there were monks living there in the late 300s AD, and this was built in the mid 500s by the Emperor Justinian, the same guy who built the Hagia Sophia Church in Istanbul. How many of you have been to Hagia Sophia? Shame on the rest of you. You've got to go see that building. But you've got to go to Istanbul. My two favorite buildings in the whole world are the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul and the, the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, Gaudi's uh, church. And completely different, but both just staggering. They will knock your eyes out. So the same guy who was responsible for building the Hagia Sophia, a church built in the 500s that the Statue of Liberty could stand upright under the dome minus her torch. Uh, that's how awesome that church is. The same guy was responsible for building this monastery. And it is one of the most historic. It has an extraordinary collection. In fact, one of the oldest and most complete versions of the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, uh, which is called the Codex Sinaiticus, was found here um, not too very long ago. We'll talk about that when we get into details about this. It's also, they have one of the most extraordinary collections of icons in the world, especially crusader icons. Crusader icons are icons of this particular style during the crusader periods. 
They have um, just extraordinary artworks and uh, various kinds of other liturgical um, items. Uh, so you get, they've got a tiny museum there, and everything in that museum is a treasure. I mean, I walked in there, and again, it's not very big, and I'm looking at this, the oldest gospel, uh, copy of the Gospel of Mark that's available, you know, uh, a copy of the Syriac Bible that's even older than the Codex Sinaiticus. Some versions of the Codex Sinaiticus. What happened, as has often happened in things like this, is they loaned it to the Russians to show it to the Tsar in memory of its celebration of his birthday, and they didn't give it back. Oh. <laughs> and then the British got it. Oh. The British have a lot of the stuff. We'll talk about that when we talk about Greece, too. Uh, a lot of the things are in the British Museum. And so, including the Rosetta Stone, the thing that allowed them to first translate hieroglyphics, uh, including a lot of the, the Elgin marbles, as they're called, from the Parthenon in Greece. Uh, a lot of that stuff is in London. So, uh, it, but then in Berlin, they have the, um, the, the gate from the Ishtar Gate from Babylonia. So, who knows? You know, that's in Berlin. Um, so we'll have an opportunity to go to St. Catherine's, and this this is what this is the old sort of fortified because it was a time when they had a real concern with people attacking, you know, because churches and monasteries they usually had gold candlesticks and stuff. So people were always wanting to try to attack them in the old days. And you'll notice when you get there, I don't think you can see it right now, but right here, that little dark spot, when you get there, and I'm sure you're all gonna want to go now. You look up, and it looks like this little shed, almost like an outhouse, hanging up about three-quarters of the way up on the wall. Until about the start of the 20th century, that was the only way to get into the monastery, was they would lower a rope down from that little shed-looking thing, three-quarters of the way up this fortified wall, and haul you up. Well, later on, when the problems, there weren't as many people trying to attack them, they decided to actually have a door. So now you can walk in, you don't have to get roped up through, through that entrance. But it's fascinating that that little, little thing is still there. So St. Catherine's Monastery is one of the great locations in the world, and an opportunity to, to be, at least traditionally, where Moses and the Israelites came, where the Ten Commandments were given, the law of God came to the Jewish people. That's right there. Okay? It's a sacred place to both Jew, well, to all three, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. One of the treasures they have in the St. Catharines is the permission given by Muhammad, because the Muslims control this area during Muhammad's life, Muhammad gave them special permission to continue there without paying any rent, without paying the, the fees. There was a tax on Christians. They didn't have to pay the fees. Nobody could challenge them, and it has, purportedly, Muhammad's own handprint on it as a testimony. He was illiterate. Muhammad was illiterate. And so he put his handprint on it as a sign of the fact that this was him. And so that's been honored ever since. Um, nobody has ever messed with uh, St. Catherine's because of that. All right. From that point, we will then go up this Gulf of Aqaba to the very end to the city of Aqaba, which is, again, sorry you can't see it for some of you, right down there. This is the sort of odd-shaped um, is the, the nation of Jordan. We will visit Jordan. It is called the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And I will explain what Hashemite is all about. One of the talks I'm going to do is called Lawrence of Arabia, the Bedouins, an allied victory in the First World War. And for the women in the group, I think you'll like that one too. The guys always get excited when I'm talking about the First World War. But um, in that, I will talk about what Hashemite means and why this is the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. All right? Um, the, we won't see that mosque. That's in Amman, Jordan. This is the uh, Abu Darwish Mosque in Jordan, but it's a beautiful mosque and sort of a symbol. By the way, you will often, in the flags of the Middle East, you will often see a white star. And that white star is a symbol of the Arab revolt that happened during the First World War when the Arabs joined with the British specifically with Lawrence of Arabia, to fight against the Ottoman Empire. And that Arab revolt was seen, even though it ended up because of a lot of deceit, the Arabs were not given what they were promised if they would fight against the Ottomans. Um, still, they recognized that as the time of Arab unity and of a time when they gained their independence from the Ottoman Empire. So that you'll see that star on several Mil Middle Eastern flags, and that's what that means. There's just under 8 million people in Jordan, um, a land area about almost 90,000 square kilometers. It is a constitutional monarchy, which technically is like, like England. You know, they have a king or a queen. 
uh, but they also have a parliamentary government. Now, the, the king in Jordan has more authority in government than the Queen of England does, but it's a similar kind of setup. They, the language is modern standard Arabic. You may have noticed that Egyptian Arabic was the language in Egypt. There's not one Arabic. There are somewhere between 22 and 30 dialects, depending on how you split it up. And, and it's very difficult for different dialects to understand each other. Jordan has decided they're going to they're gonna accept sort of the academic standard, which is called modern standard Arabic. Um, the, the money is the, the Jordanian dinar. Um, it, just some general ideas about this country. Um, it's one of the things that's fascinating about Jordan, and Jordan is at peace with pretty much everybody around them. Jordan and Egypt are the two Arab countries that have, have peace treaties, lasting peace treaties, with the nation of Israel now. So they're not having any difficulties. Jordan and Israel still haven't quite figured out what to do with the West Bank. And we're going to talk about that issue as well when we go along. Um, but the main reason that we are going to Jordan, um, the city of Aqaba, which is right at the end of the Gulf of Aqaba, uh, and by the way, this is, is Israel. So Elat, Israel, is right now. I mean, when we land, uh, when we pull into port in Aqaba, if you look over to the left-hand side, you're looking at Israel. You're looking at the city uh, of Elat, which is on the, um, the Gulf of Aqaba. We are going here primarily, although there are other things to do, to go to Petra. Some people will go to Wadi Rum, which is a really uh, rough area there. We'll talk about the Wadi Rum a little bit again when we talk about Lawrence of Arabia, because that's some of the area where he and the troops that were working with him were doing some of their military maneuvers. They conquered the city of Aqaba, and in doing so, um, that was a really significant effort in trying to control the Middle East from the Ottoman Empire. So Petra, this is one of the images. This is the treasury, it's called, when you first walk through the sea. I'll tell you all about this. We'll do a talk about the Nabataeans, the people that built the city of Petra, and the Rose City of Petra. When you first walk through this half kilometer long canyon, which sometimes gets very narrow, and you walk out of it, that's the first thing you see. How many of you saw uh, Indiana Jones and is it the Temple of Doom, I think it was, that this was in? They're riding the horses through this thing, and they come out and here's this, well, it's real. That's where they shot it. So you'll have a chance to see that. Now, um, that's not all. Some people think that that's Petra. No, this is the first building. Petra is over 400 acres. Um, there is a lot to see. There is a lot of walking around. You don't have to go to all of it. Um, one of the things you can do if you want is you can walk up to the top of the mountain where they have an even larger carved facade than this. It's called the Treasury, uh, Al Dair, up on top of the hill. It's, what is it, 900 steps up to it? So it's a pretty good climb, it's a pretty good workout. But you don't have to do that to be able to appreciate this, all right? There's a lot of stuff down below. So this city was first inhabited around the 300s BC. So this place has had people living there for, you know, 2300 years. Um, it is one of the great world heritage sites. In fact, this is one of the places, Smithsonian Magazine said that Petra is one of the 28 places you absolutely have to see before you die. I would add uh, Luxor and probably St. Catharines to that as well. I mean, all of these. This trip was voted, the, this particular trip, was voted the best exotic vacation by, was it Condé Nast or Cruise Magazine, one of those, um, because of the fact it's got all of these, you know, uh, I'm not keen on the idea of bucket list. I just don't like that expression. But if you have a bucket list, these things should be on them because these are really top you know, top flight locations. Um, now, one of the interesting things about Jordan when we're there is Jordan really right, it is right in the middle of the Middle East. They have Saudi Arabia on one side, Iraq on one side, um, Syria to the north, Israel along the entire um, western side with the, the Jordan River, the West Bank, Palestine, or the Palestinian territories, depending on where you are in that whole discussion, but it depends on what you call it. Um, is here, this area. Lebanon is not very far away, and of course Egypt is right here. And so Jordan is right in the middle of all of those things. Um, and the fact that they have been at peace with Israel and with all of the Arab neighbors, they've been a good model for some of the other, other nations in this area. We then will come back down, again the whole length of the Gulf of Aqaba, through the Straits of Tehran, there, to back onto the mainland to Hergada which is a city on the coast. This is a tourist city. 
I mean, it was it was built for that. It's not been around for more than 30 years or so. But it first became it was a little fishing village, and then it very quickly became a place where people would come to the beach. It's got pretty ideal weather. The temperature usually is right around um, mid to upper 80s. The water is warm. The snorkeling and scuba is great. You can ride a camel if you want. We love camels. We think camels are very cool. And so uh, you have a chance to do that. Um, there, the activities, now unfortunately, Hurgada, as Rob had told you earlier, we're going to have to cut that a little bit short. We don't have all the opportunities that we would have had because of the next thing that we're going to be doing, um, and that is the transit of the Suez Canal. From Hurgada here, we will go up through the whole length of the Gulf of Suez. We will enter the Suez Canal here at the town of Suez and make the transit. Now, the thing about the Suez Canal is it's only one way. There's only two places where boats can be going in both directions at once along the route. And that is, whoops, these buttons are too close together and my thumb's <laughs> too big, I think. Um, well, that's, you know, this is the, the route. Here, what's called the, the Great Bitter Lake, and then here at the north end where they've got two lanes. Now, the government of Egypt is building a second lane and they expect that they will be able to double the amount of traffic then because boats will be able to go both directions. Right now, they average about 47 boats a day is all that can get through there, and you have to go through in convoy because you have to line up, and it's it's like a one-way, you know, where they got flagmen and they're doing construction, you can only, traffic goes one way for a while, and then they stop that, and they go the other way for a while. Well, that's what the Suez Canal is. So the word that they got is they changed the timing and our boat has to be there by a certain time, early a.m., uh, in order to be in the convoy or we get delayed you know, a day or two. And so that's why we have to leave Hargada early. But we will transit the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal itself is very important. It is one of the most important waterways in the world. It was built in the 1860s originally, but there, there had been efforts as far back as some of the early pharaohs, they recognized the potential of cutting, the, because there are other lakes in there, there already was waterways, the idea of connecting this and being able to have boats go from the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea, they had been talking about that for 2,000 years before they actually built it. And so when they finally built it in the 1860s, this immediately became the mo one of the most important waterways in the world for the very simple reason that from anywhere in Europe to get to India or anywhere in Asia, if you don't have the Suez Canal, you've got an extra 4,300 miles that you have to sail very rough waters around the south end of Africa. And so this has always been, since it was built, critically important. They have fought several wars over control of this. The British especially, because the jewel in the British crown, of course, was? India. India. And whenever the Suez Canal was threatened, that threatened British's ability to get to and from India. And so the British have always been invested in making sure the Suez Canal remains safe, including on more than one occasion, they come in and invaded on the grounds that, well, somebody else is threatening and we're doing it for the sake of the Egyptian people. So, uh, which is all well and good. That's the way politics are in the world, right? So this is very, very important. Um, it's 120 miles in total length. And so we will spend the day, uh, you'll have a chance to go out, and literally it's, it's 100 and, what is it, um, it is 600 feet wide in places. So you can see both banks very, very easily as we go along. Um, in fact, there's a scene, one of the talks that I'm going to do will be, uh, as I said, Lawrence of Arabia, and I will do that talk in the morning, and in the afternoon, we will have the movie, Lawrence of Arabia, Academy Award winner, listed as one of the 10 best movies ever made. Okay. Uh, great film. My wife and I have seen it a couple times recently. But in that movie, there's a scene where he travels by camel with one of his assistants, and they're trying to get to the Suez Canal because they're trying to get back to the British, and they're sort of struggling on, struggling on, and all of a sudden, they look up through these ruins, and there's this freighter or tanker going by, you know, like in the, it almost looks like it's the middle of the desert, and they get up past these buildings, and you realize that here's this canal in the middle of nowhere. There are no locks in the Suez Canal. It's all, uh, it's, there's the same level of sea in the Mediterranean as there is in the Red Sea, so it's just a big ditch. Um, but until they, they get the second lane put in, then they will not be able to have traffic going more than one direction at one time, okay? So we'll talk about some of that stuff later. Then, 
after we exit the Suez Canal, we have a couple of more days of sailing to get us to Athens. Um, the, we'll pop, go to the east and then north of Crete to get to Athens. How many of you have been to Athens before? Okay, good for you. Special treat for those who haven't. Um, Athens is antiquities galore. I mean, Athens is one of the oldest cities in the world. It is the, they believe that people have been living there for 11,000 years. It is the seat of so much of we take for granted in Western culture. The, it's where philosophy, as we understand philosophy, was invented. Plato and Aristotle were from there. Western arts and sculpture, uh, theater was invented there. Democracy first occurred in Athens, which it was a city-state. It's the capital of Greece now, but originally it was its own country. Uh, the countries of Greece were so separated by mountains, they were each individual government entities. They were city-states. And so Athens has had more influence on um, Western culture, and that includes Western Europe and North America, than probably any other single country in terms of the underlying kind of values and things. The particular things, this is a very old picture of the way the Acropolis would have uh, looked when they actually had still had all the statues and everything up there. But when you go to Athens, if you have to go to the Acropolis. You have to go up and see the Parthenon, uh, which was built during the Golden Age of Greece. I'm going to do a talk the last day before we get to Greece on Greece as the birthplace of Western culture. So we'll talk about all that. Um, but in addition to going to the Parthenon and see, or to the Acropolis and seeing the Parthenon and the other temples there, you must go to the new Parthenon Museum. Now the new Parthenon Museum is a state-of-the-art museum, and it has a lot of some of the original, some uh, replicas of things taken from the Parthenon in order to preserve them. Interestingly, the Elgin marbles and some of the other things that the British took and put in the British Museum, Greece has been asking for them back for hundreds of years. And the British have always said, no, we're not going to give them to you because you don't have any place to keep them that's safe and temperature controlled and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's one of the reasons that they built the new Parthenon Museum, which is absolutely state of the art. And so the Greeks are now saying, we now have some place to put all that stuff, we want it back. And the British are going, <laughs> no. we'll see what happens. Um, I'm not picking on the British, I love the British, by the way. Um, I also would recommend to you, however, the National Archaeological Museum, which my wife and I discovered last time we were in Athens, which is extraordinary. If you've ever looked at a book of different cultures, especially European cultures, and you might have seen you know, some of the great Greek statues of Hermes, the Mask of Agamemnon, some of the other artifacts, for instance, from the Minoan culture on Crete, like the, you know, the snake goddess uh, porcelain sculpture, and all, all of that stuff, all of the things that you see in these books is in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. So I have to tell you, my own personal opinion would be if you have to choose between the Parthenon Museum and the National Archaeological Museum, I'd go to the National Archaeological Museum. Another museum we would recommend to you, which is one of our very favorites, is the Byzantine Museum. Of course, uh, Byzantine, when Con Constantine in the 300s took over the whole Roman Empire and moved the capital to Constantinople, it was called uh, Byzantium before that, and then he called it New Rome, but everybody else started calling it Constantinople and it sort of stuck. So that became the home of the Eastern Roman Empire which became known as the Byzantine Empire. It was Rome, but it continued for, when you ask people who took history classes, when did the Roman Empire fall? And they'll tell you, well, in the 400s. No, it lasted for a thousand years after that. It lasted until, you know, uh, almost the time that Columbus discovered America, because the, the capital in Constantinople maintained the Eastern Roman Empire for over a thousand years after Rome fell to the barbarians. Okay? So this museum is about the Byzantine culture and it is quite extraordinary and we'd recommend that to you as well. Um, these are all my own personal recommendations. So you can take them or leave them, but that's, these are some of the things we really enjoy. Now, these are the talks I'm going to be doing over the next uh, 18 days or 17 days now. Today, obviously, the Introduction to the Wonders of Arabia then tomorrow I will in the morning be doing a talk called Birthplace of Empires where we'll look at the Mesopotamian civilization, where civilization as we understand civilization began in Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, and then Egypt, and then uh, the, er the, the 
first Babylonian empires, and then the later Neo-Babylonians, and the Assyrians, and the Hittites, and all of that, and how those things happen in the flow of history. Then we will talk about in the afternoon a talk on faith and culture in the ancient Near East from the primitive um, polytheistic religions to the more sophisticated polytheistic religions, like to some extent Egypt, but certainly uh, Greece and Rome and then to the invention of ethical monotheism, as it's called, which is Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. We'll talk about those. The next day, in the morning, I will do a talk on the history and culture of Oman. The fascinating, it really is quite fascinating, especially when you find out about this man, Sultan Qaboos, and what he has done in the last 45 years in that country. It was one of the most oppressed and downtrodden and degrading countries in the world, and now it is quite enlightened. And then in the afternoon, we will talk about unity and diversity in the Middle East. Sort of the focus of that is so many people who have not had experience in this region think that all Middle Easterners are Arabs. It's not true. They all speak the same language. Not true. Uh, that they all have the, the, the same basic orientation. You know, they're all Muslim. Well, Shiite Muslim, Sunni Muslim, Ibadi Muslim, Alawite Muslim, very different. And sometimes they get along and many times they don't. In fact, there's a lot more conflict between certain Shiites and Sunnis than there is between any other religious groups almost in the world. Uh, and so we'll talk about in what ways is the Middle East a unity and in what ways is there diversity there and what does that mean in terms of how it get, gets played out. We then will visit Salala Oman and then the next day in the morning I'll do a talk called the Children of Abraham. The three great monotheistic religions all trace their roots back to one man. That's Abraham. They're called the Abrahamic religions. So we'll talk about Judaism, Christianity, Islam, how each of them rose up, how they differed, and where they are today. And then in the afternoon, Moses, the Israelites, and crossing the Red Sea. By that time, we'll be in the Red Sea. The next day, I will do a talk on the, an introduction to Islam. I'll give you the history, some of the basics, the world religions thing is one, one of the, the primary things I've focused on over the years, and so we'll talk about Islam. And then the next day, uh, or the, that afternoon on the 30th, we'll talk about alone in the desert, Christian monasticism. What, what possibly possessed these people to give up everything they owned and move to the Egyptian desert from all over the Mediterranean? Um, we'll talk about that in preparation for going to St. Catherine's Monastery. Then, and I broke these up into April and May because it's sort of in the middle of where we are, I'll do Lawrence of Arabia, the Bedouins, and Allied Victory in the First World War, and then in the afternoon we'll have the movie Lawrence of Arabia for you in here. The next day, Mysteries of the Nabataeans and Petra, in preparation for that visit. Then two talks on Egypt. The Permanence of Ancient Egypt, where I'll talk about the extended history, the longest continuous history in the world, about the pharaohs. Uh, we'll look at the, a lot of those details. Then on the, the next day, pharaohs, temples, and tombs will be specifically in preparation for Luxor. Uh, about more details about Karnak, about Luxor, about the Valley of the Kings, We'll talk about the religion, because these were religious sites. We'll talk about the religion. We'll get into hieroglyphs a little bit. Uh, I am not an authority on hieroglyphics. Did I say I'm not an Egyptologist? <laughs> but I know enough about it to give you kind of an introduction. There's some things you could be looking for, which I think you'll find interesting. Then we have five days uh, of visits, actually six days. We have two days and overnight, uh, when we land at Safaga to Luxor, and we'll stay at the Luxor Hilton, which is a spectacular hotel. And you won't have a lot of time in the hotel, though, because we've got a lot to see. Then Sharm El Sheikh and St. Catharines, if you choose to go on that, that trip. Then Ahmad Jordan and Petra. Then we come back to Hurghada. And then we have a day of transit in the Suez Canal. When we get out of the Suez Canal, we have two more days, and I will do a morning talk on the Crusades, one of the most misunderstood periods in history. We'll talk about the Crusades and what caused them you know, what happened in them and what their long-term results were. We will look at history, culture, and conflict in the Middle East. This is the most subjective of these. This is where I'm going to give you more of my own reflections as to what, why is it that the Middle East is the region of the world which is almost impossible for them to find peace. And we'll talk about that. Then I'm going to talk about Alexander the Great and Hellenism. Hellenism is how everything became Greekified because Hellas was the ancient name for Greece. Why is it that by the time of Jesus, for instance, everyone spoke Greek? Even the Jews spoke Greek. In fact, the Jews had spoken Greek so much they forgot how to speak Hebrew, which is why they had to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, the Septuagint. That happened 
several hundred years before Jesus came along. But the uh, Alexander the Great is the one that caused all of that. And then the last talk I'll do, uh, the, the afternoon before we get back to Athens, is Greece as the birthplace of Western civilization. So, take a deep breath. I know I will. <laughs> I have one other thing for you, and then I'll, I'll take any questions you have. Um, it is some basic phrases in Arabic. Because even though there are different dialects of Arabic that we'll talk about, there still are certain things, and, and we actually have this on paper. I'll hand it out to you. We've got these half sheets. Some of the things you might want to know how to say. A formal greeting, which everyone appreciates, is to say, may peace be upon you. It is, assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Salam means peace. Assalamu alaikum. If you, when you meet somebody, and I've had the experience of meeting people a couple of times, and I, I would go, assalamu alaikum, and you put your hand over your heart, and like in Petra, an old man went, good Arabic. <laughs> they really appreciate it. You don't have to worry particularly about how to pronounce it, but if you say assalamu alaikum, they will really appreciate it. And then the response if someone says that to you is wa alaikum assalam. Just turn it around. If you want to say hello, which is less formal, they, they may peace be upon you, uh, assalamu alaikum is a way of saying hello in a formal way. Um, to, an informal hello is marhaban. If, when you're leaving, a way to say goodbye is ma'asa salam, which is go with peace. Until next time, you know, ila a lika'a. And then nice to meet you, forza sa'i'ida. Please, min fadli. Thank you, shukran. That's a very important one. Shukran. Even more important, la shukran. No thank you. <laughs> if someone's trying to sell you something and you don't want it, la shukran. No thank you. Um, yes is nam. How much? is calm. If you're interested in something, almost everywhere you go they're going to speak English, but it's a nice gesture, all right? You're welcome is alan wa salan. I'm sorry or excuse me, ana'a asif. Where is the bathroom? Where is is aina? Uh, the bathroom is al hamam and let's go, which you'll hear from the guides that yala yala. Let's go, let's go. If you would like a copy of this, we have these half sheets. My wife Carolyn, right here by the camera, has got them. Just drop by there and pick one up. And now, that's my talk for today as an introduction. Are there any questions? Anything <laughs> I can answer for you? Yes, up here first. We are not going to see pyramids, no. Because the pyramids were there in the north. Sorry about the speaker. One of the things... Um, during different time periods in Egypt, as different dynasties, there were uh, over 30 dynasties of pharaohs, different dynasties as they ruled, they would move the capital to different places. Well, when the capital was in the north, in Memphis, that was the early kingdom, and they built the pyramids up there in Giza, it's close to Cairo. There was a period of time, uh, Akhenaten, this, this fascinating guy, Amenhotep IV changed his name to Akhenaten, and he tried to introduce monotheism. He tried to focus on just one god, God Aten. And he moved the capital away from all these other religious sites to uh, Amarna. And where we are in Luxor is the longest period of time, and it's primarily to the god Amun, who became Amun-Ra. They sort of blended some gods together. But there are no pyramids where we are, but trust me, it's still going to be spectacular. Okay? There was a question here? Uh, will most of the talks be 45 minutes, an hour? 45 minutes to an hour, and I give permission to anybody who gets tired of it to get up and walk out. Okay, um, but I, the, one of the difficulties I had, there are, some of these are brand new for this trip. Some of them I gave last time on this trip, but uh, we had an Egyptologist visit. Have I mentioned that? <laughs> I, I'm um, and so I'm covering some of the Egypt stuff for this as well. And so we've got some, I've got some new talks for that. But a few of these I've t given several times. In fact, we have, you know, I don't know where Jim and Carolyn are back there. They actually are here because they heard a bunch of these talks already. <laughs> and I'm very flattered that they decided to come on the trip because I told people um, who came to lectures I was giving in Mexico that, that this trip was available and they came along. So one of the problems is when I give a lecture three or four times, every time I think of something else and it's it longer and longer and longer. But I'm going to try to keep it within 45 minutes to an hour here, okay? Uh, and if, if, any, if I get, uh, I'm going to give my wife permission to start doing this oh, if I get carried away. I need right? a watch. <laughs> it, it, yeah, right now, it's, I'm, not, I'm still under an hour. Any other questions? Yes? Can you explain the origin of the name Arabia or Arabic? 
Um, a radio. Let me get into that when we talk about uh, it's some of the words, the the Arab. In fact, one somebody asked me recently, what is an Arab? Technically, an Arab is anyone whose first language is Arabic, and so um, an Arab is an Arabic word. So we'll talk about that. I'll get into it. I don't want to talk about that right now. So, any other questions? Thank you very much for being here. I hope you make the rest of the talk. And we look forward to it.